Hey, I got some housekeeping things for us today before we, before we jump into the message. Um, two things. One, um, last Monday, my grandmother turned 90 years old. So happy birthday, Grandma. I love you. If you can see me, you're beautiful. I'm so, glad that, I'm so glad that you get to watch me raise my daughters and you get to have these amazing great-granddaughters. My, my, my daughters get to have an amazing, amazing great-grandma. So happy 90th birthday, Grandma. Secondly, today is my parents' 40th wedding anniversary. So that's pretty cool. So um, I didn't get you guys a gift. This is it. So you're welcome. No. Uh, 40 years, though, Dad, that is Old. That is old. You are old, Dad. Um, so I just had to get that out. I had to get those, those quick few things out of there. So truth be told, that's the message today. Uh, that's our series that we're in right now. And I love, I love the concept of, of like truth be told. Like anytime somebody says truth be told, uh, it, it, it means a, a cool statement is coming. And I've always enjoyed those statements. I've always like enjoyed to like debunk like a myth or an urban legend. And back when I was a kid, we didn't have internet really. And so like when we heard an urban legend, we just believed it for like years. Do you guys remember that? When it was just like, people would say the most like obnoxious things. And you're like, that's, it's true. It's like, I have no way of disproving it, right? And I remember like specifically one that was like, if you took a penny and you drop it off the Empire State Building, it would be moving so fast by the time it hit the ground, it would dent the sidewalk, right? And I just remember being like, wow, that's incredible. Like, I didn't deny it at all. I was just like, that is truth, right? Um, there's also more like morbid versions of that same one, but I'll skip those today. Uh, but then shows like Mythbusters came around, which I absolutely loved. I was raised on Mythbusters. Uh, much of the way that they think on that show is the way I like to think about things. And what they would do is they would take these urban legends and they would say, well, truth be told, that's actually not the case. Like truth be told, there's more than meets the eye in this. And then they would debunk these myths. And so today I want to, I want to, you know, debunk a couple uh, myths with you real quick and as well as maybe provide some insight. So one myth that seems to be popular in, um, particularly media world and TV shows and things like that, pastors and the way that we're portrayed. I've said this to my wife and I get frustrated every time I watch a show with a pastor in it because they always have like a long black robe on and like the Catholic collar. And I'm like, they're in like a Christian church and the pastor's like wearing this and holding a Bible that's like 900 pages thick. You guys, you guys know what I'm talking about? It's, it's ridiculous. That is not what we dress like. I, I'm wearing a shirt with tents on it right now. Um, that is not what we dress like. The, the second thing about pastors is I think people often believe that all we do is like sit in our, in our offices and our dens and we just digest scripture all day long. That's all we do. We don't even like see the sunlight ever. We just like only come out on Sundays and preach and then retreat back into our dens to study. Um, that's just not the case. And honestly, there are moments that if you could just like watch for a split second, if you could watch what I was doing, you would question whether or not I was a pastor <laughs> altogether. If you saw me in a Costco parking lot where somebody is walking diagonally across the parking lot and I'm having to slowly drive behind them to get into the store, if you saw me in that moment, you would question I was, if I was a pastor at all. And now that we're here, I have a quick presentation for everybody because this is important stuff. Let's go to the screen here for a second. Costco parking lots, okay? There is a way to walk across them, everybody. This is a very simple system, okay? So if you're parked here and you need to get here, the common thought for whatever reason is, let's, let's show, put up that first slide, right? Oh, I'll just walk directly to the door, right? This is incorrect. Let's put the X up. That is incorrect. We do not do that. That is sinful, okay? Go to the next slide. This one here. So this is the common thought where if you're doing this, there's people that are trying to get here and they're slowly driving up as you meander down this walkway. It's like, do you not have anywhere to be when you're walking? Like you're walking at the pace of a slow turtle, not even a turtle, a slow turtle, okay? So then commonly, I'll see people that have wised up a little bit and they go for this route. 
This route here, where they walk down along the cars, which is great, good job. But then they still cut across this lane and there's all these cars trying to get through here. This is still incorrect, people, okay? It's not that difficult, but apparently we have to review these things um, on a grand scale. I've done this with my youth group before. This is very important stuff. Stick with me, okay? This is the proper route, okay? You get out of your car, you look both ways, okay? You walk here. Stop at the cart return like you should have been taught when you were a little child. Look both ways before you cross. Get over to the sidewalk and then proceed to the door. Can I get an amen? All right. Unfortunately, I always get stuck behind this person who doesn't know where they're going. They get here and they're like, are we going to Trader Joe's? No, we're going to Costco. Oh, we're going to Costco? Do I have my mask? And they go back. Oh, I do have my mask. And they come here and like, is this the entrance? No, that's the exit. Wait, is that a bird over there? Do I see a squirrel? Is that, wow, look at that. And then they finally go inside, okay? If you want to know the proper form and the proper way to get, uh, to, to remember this, I have a little theory for you. This is the Pythagorean theorem, all right? Do not abuse the hypotenuse. Remember that, okay? This is the, the yes, it's the shortest route technically, but you need to go, you need to go A, plus B, not just go across C. Can I get an amen today? Can I get an amen for that? Truth be told, it's like I'm working with five-year-olds in the Costco parking lot, and it's very frustrating. So as you can see, uh, truth be told, I'm probably going to yell about this more than I will in my message today. I hope that's okay with you guys. But so truth be told, I love to like get past the first layer of information and get into the deeper stuff. And so uh, today we're actually going to be going into the book of or going into the life of Peter rather than the book of Second Peter. And so uh, Tom said, let's, let's, let's just get a, a really good rundown on who Peter was and what we could pull from his life. When truth be told, let's learn about who Peter is. Not just the common knowledge, but the more in-depth stuff. And so let's look at this together. So Simon was originally from Bethsaida. We see this in John 1, And he lived in Capernaum. We see that in Mark 1, Simon is Peter, by the way. Spoiler alert. Uh, he and James and John were partners in a profitable fishing business. And we see this in Luke 5.10. Uh, Simon met Jesus through his brother Andrew, who had followed Jesus after hearing John the Baptist proclaim the news that he was the Lamb of God. Um, upon meeting Simon, Jesus gave him a new name, Cephas, which is Aramaic, or Peter, which is Greek, which means the rock. Now, I want to make it clear, it's not this rock. Well, that would be cool if that was Peter. That's not him, okay? That's Dwayne the Rock Johnson. Uh, Peter we're talking about is the rock or the foundation of the church. He spent three years following Jesus as one of Jesus' disciples. More significantly, uh, it was Peter who first confessed Jesus as the Christ and the Son of the living God. That's a big move. That's a big thing for a Jewish person to do at the time. A truth which Jesus said was divinely revealed to Peter in Matthew 16, 16 through 17. Uh, many know Peter from the story of, um, let's see how, how, the story of redemption um, that happened at the end of the Gospels in which he denies Jesus three times. We know this story. He denies Jesus three times. Jesus is put to death. Peter goes away. He's, he's just feeling it, man. He's hurting. Um, Jesus comes back from the grave and he goes and he meets Peter and three times he gives Peter the opportunity, opportunity to redeem himself. It's a beautiful story of him being reinstated and being redeemed. Um, and then uh, Peter goes on to lay the foundation or the rock that the church is built on and boldly goes forth to where God calls him and preaches the gospel to the Gentiles for the first time. Now, this is kind of the life of Peter. We, uh, we, you also may have heard the facts that like, you know, Peter and Paul were, were martyred on the same day uh, by Emperor Nero. Um, that Peter was, according to the church and according to legend, he was hung upside down on a cross. Uh, while this isn't stated in scripture, this has just been passed down as a, a thought about him, um, which actually fulfills a prophecy given by Jesus. What seems to be talked about less about Peter's life, though, is why does he have the name The Rock? Like, why is he the foundation of the church? And this question isn't always answered. I think if you read through the book of Acts, you can put the pieces together. But today I want to answer that for you. Truth be told, why is Peter called this? So um, Jesus promises Peter 
that he would be foundational in building the church, right? Um, and it was fulfilled in three stages. Three big steps took place that really fulfilled this uh, calling from Jesus. First was this. Uh, Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. And that's a big moment. He, he, in one message, obviously not he, God working through Peter in one message, brought 3,000 new believers into the family. 3,000. I've never, I don't even know if I've ever hit double digits of new believers, let alone triple digits. That's insane. 3,000, wait, quadruple digits. That's a lot of people, right? 3,000 people in one message. That's in Acts chapter 2. Then the second thing that Peter did, he was present when the Samaritans received the Holy Spirit. That's where you get that vision of the curtain being torn in two and the gospel is now available for everybody. It's a beautiful part of scripture. Um, Peter was, was there. He was foundational in this portion of scripture taking place. And third, um, finally, he is summoned to the home of the Roman centurion Cornelius, who uh, also believed and received the Holy Spirit and basically made Rome into a, Jewish, or into a Christian nation for a little bit. And that's in Acts chapter 10. So in these three ways, Peter unlocked three different worlds and opened the doors of the church to the Jews, to the Samaritans, and to the Gentiles. And when you look at it like that, it's like, holy cow, what didn't this guy do, right? Like that, that's quite a resume. He could get a youth pastor job at any church he wants to, right? Like that is impressive, Peter. And here's what I personally love about Peter is because a lot of times we, we look at characters in the Bible and what they're doing and how they're acting, it feels completely unattainable. Like it doesn't feel like something we could actually do. But with Peter, there's a sense that like he is like, he is very relatable. He seems like, it's almost like he's one of us, which he is, right? Uh, and so in the life of Peter, we have a beautiful case study of what it looks like for someone who loves and works and belongs and is obedient to Jesus. And then it also is a human on the other side of it. And so Paul is often looked at as an example, but he's sometimes kind of unrelatable because he is just uh, a fantastic human being. Uh, Peter not only spent time with Jesus, but he was best friends with Jesus. And he just seems very relatable, especially in his rashness, which is something that I struggle with myself sometimes. Um, he has moments in which he makes a, a quick decision or he jumps into a situation or he just says something and it's very human. And we just don't see that with all the other disciples all the time. So there's something about Peter where his humanity really shows through um, in, in a way that helps us as believers relate to him. Moments of rashness in which Jesus says, you know, I'm going to be killed and I'm going to be resurrected and I'm going to come back. And he's explaining this to his disciples. What does Peter do? He doesn't listen. He calls Jesus out. <laughs> he scolds them, right? Jesus doesn't let that fly. Uh, he's the first one to climb out of the boat and try to walk on the water as Jesus does the same, as Jesus is walking on the water towards them. Um, and he's also the first to doubt and begin to sink. Uh, he attacks the guards in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was being arrested. He just gets angry and, and strikes a guard. He denies Jesus three times. This is a very human moment for Peter and probably one of the most humbling moments of his life. And even in the book of Acts, there are moments where his human side shows up, where his pride shows through, where he says things, or you can see he's getting frustrated. You can see he's withdrawing from situations that might make him look a certain way. Um, but Peter's life in the Gospels are completely different than Peter's life in the book of Acts. And mainly because Jesus had died and been resurrected, and that really awoke something within Peter. But truth be told, if we look at Peter's life, we can get three promises, three truths from the life of Peter. You guys want to hear them today? That sound good? Let's jump into it. First off is this. Through all of Peter's ups and downs, the Lord Jesus remained his loving and faithful guide. Man, there are so many moments in which Jesus could have been like, you didn't hide me? No, man. Paul's going to be the rock. <laughs> like, no, John's going to be the rock. No. Jesus is his faithful guide, constantly driving and pointing him in the right direction. When, when Peter steps out, Jesus doesn't step out as well. He's constantly faithful and remains loving. Second one is this, second truth we can pull from Peter's life. Jesus sees Peter as he intends him to be, not who he currently is. I mean, the first thing he does is renames him. 
Can you imagine if somebody did this to you? Like if I was like, hi, Josiah Perrin, I'm the youth pastor here. Thank you for hiring me, Tom. And Tom's like, no, nope, you're now Bob. <laughs> you know, I'm just like, what? He's like, yep, Bob, which means this and this. And I'm like, okay, you know, like that's weird, but fine. No, he says, you are Peter, which means rock. You are going to be the foundation of the church. And yeah, there's going to be some real low moments before we get there, but this is who I see you as. Jesus sees people as he intends them to be, as he created them to be, not who they currently are. And that is something that is just beautiful. There's something very parental about that, which I just love. The third thing is this. Peter isn't redeemed by his actions, but by his close relationship with God. The whole book of Acts is called Acts because it's referring to the acts of the apostles after Jesus left. And none of those acts are the thing that redeem them. It's something that God wants. It's something that God calls us to. It's called obedience. It is beautiful, but that's not the redeeming thing. What Jesus did on the cross is what redeemed him. That's what gives him eternity with Jesus. That's what gives him salvation. Not what he did, but what, what Jesus did. And so Peter is the model. He's the example of, of what it looks like when a human legitimately tries their best and lives for God. And he does a great job. And so as we watch him, as we learn from him, as we read what he says, and we read you know, the book of Mark, which was largely written by him, uh, or at least his stories, if we, as we read the book of Acts, as we read First and Second Timothy, or sorry, First and Second Peter, I ask us today as believers who serve the same God, the same one, the same Jesus who walked on the water, the same Jesus who died and rose again, are our priorities as a culture and as a nation and more personally as a family in the same spot as Peter's? I'm asking myself the same question. And I don't believe that they always are. When the news and the culture shifts or changes, are we worried about how it affects us and our daily life and our comfort and our, how are we going to do this, that, or the other? Or are we worried about this hurdle that it's going to place between people coming to Jesus? I think Peter would be concerned about that. Do we lose, do we lose sleep over how well we can provide for our family or how will we provide for our family? Or do we lose sleep over the fact that there are people out there who don't rely on God for anything? And I'm not saying a, a small amount of people out there. I'm talking about a, a huge amount of, amount of humanity who is yet to meet Jesus. Does that keep us awake at night? I believe it would keep Peter awake. When we post on social media, are our concepts and ideas uniting or are they divisive? I don't believe that we should be divisive at all. And I don't believe that Peter would be divisive. I believe he speaks truth, and I think that's okay. But even then, if you do speak truth on social media, is that truth then followed up with action of you actually completing that thing? Of you actually living out that truth? Or is it just thrown out there like a concept? I add myself to this boat as well. I'm not calling out anybody uh, more than I'm calling out myself here. Because truth be told, unlike Peter and Paul, we know the end of the story and they didn't throughout their life. So they almost get a pass when it comes to the fact that he denied Jesus. He hadn't watched him resurrect yet. We know what happens. We know, we've, we've read the book of Revelation. We almost have a leg up on them in some ways. The only thing we don't have is we don't get to see Jesus in the flesh. This is not a message of shame. This is a message of hope because listen to this. Peter played by the same rules that we play by. He was led by the same Savior with the same goal, with the same humanity that we have. And so, if that's true, if you believe that to be true, we can take the truths that we spoke over Peter and apply them to our own lives. So this, we know that through all of our ups and downs, the Lord will remain a loving and faithful guide to us. We know that Jesus sees us as he intends us to be, not who we currently are, and not who we see ourselves as. We know that Jesus sees the potential in you, the amazing, the amazing potential in you. And it might feel sometimes like, well, I'm, I'll never be Peter. Will God use you in the same way as Peter? Maybe not, but God has a way to use you. God has a purpose for you. Nothing was created unintentionally. 
Finally, we know that we are redeemed not by the actions of our hands, not by the words of our mouths. We're not redeemed by our giving publicly, but our relationship and submission to God is what redeems us. That's it. Not by our actions. Not, I'm not any more redeemed because I'm standing up here preaching. It's just the truth. I'm redeemed because I've said yes to Jesus and I've allowed him into my heart. The common knowledge of us as Christians is, is typically that. Is they're a Christian. He or she believes in Jesus. He or she is a Christian. And that's usually where it ends. Uh, I'm not saying this for everybody, but in, in a lot of cases, that's, that's the extent of knowledge. That, that's the common knowledge. And that's not what people said about Peter. When people, talk, when people talked about Peter, they said he's a Christian. Yeah, but truth be told, there's something different about that guy. Truth be told, he gets it. There, there's, no reason, there's no way that everybody just said he was a Christian if, if when he walked down the street, the scripture says, as his shadow touched people, it healed them because he was so near and dear to Jesus at all times. There's no way that they just said he's a Christian. And yet, I feel so oftentimes that that's where my title probably ends. Yeah, he's a pastor. Yeah, he's a Christian. And let me, guys, let me tell you guys my goal for my life. That when people look at me, it wouldn't just be, you know, yes, that's Josiah. He is a Christian. That my daughters wouldn't look at me and just say, yeah, that's my dad. And he brought me to church. Like, that, that my wife wouldn't just look at me and say, yeah, he, you know, he read, a, he read books and, and, and spoke a lot of messages. Those are all great things, but I wish that people, when they come across me, and this is an awakening I feel like I'm having in my life now, is that when people would come across me, they would say, truth be told, that man is sold out for Jesus. Like, truth be told, there's something different when he walks in the room. He has been near and dear with Jesus throughout the day, so much so that it's almost like radiating off of him. Truth be told, Truth be told, he opens the door for the gospel to spread in places where it never thought able to be spread. That he spends so much time in the, with the Lord that it's evidence in his words, in his actions. Family, church, will you join me in this? To change our name the same way that Simon became Peter. To not just be so-and-so, the Christian, but truth be told, this person gets it. This person's bought in. This person understands. This person is seeking after who God intends them to be, not who they intend to be themselves. Not who they put themselves as. Because truth be told right now, guys, our nation and the world and our leaders need godly men and women who will unite people and not drive any more wedges between us. We need to be united and move forward. Take action and love and do what Jesus told Peter on that beach. Love my people. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. Stop dividing each other against one another. Can we be people who live as though God is our faithful and loving guide? Can we accept the redemption that Jesus extends by his death on the cross? Can we pursue being who God intends us to be, not who we want to be? That's my prayer for us today. So we're going to step into a time of communion, which is something that Peter got to do with Jesus for the first time. So why don't you take your, I don't know what this thing is, but why don't you take your little cup? Uh, this thing is cute, I guess. Uh, why don't you take your foam? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'll give you a second to get your lid off. And today, as we focus on the life of Peter, I want to encourage you to, 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 to really grasp that we're doing the same thing that he did. The same thing Peter did in the upper room with Jesus. I mean, he was a broken man. He was human. He owned a business and he left to go follow Jesus. He wasn't any different than you and I, yet he set a great example. And I'm not putting him on the same scale as Jesus by any means, but he set an amazing example for us as believers. 
of what it looks like to legitimately follow through and let action follow your words, let action follow your decisions. And when it wasn't until this happened that Peter really turned the corner. He, before this, was, honestly, his life in the gospel is, is not nothing of real impression. He has moments where it kind of shines through. But once Jesus died on the cross, his body was broken, his blood was spilled, and he was resurrected, Peter understood what Jesus was doing, and he lived it out, man. So today, as believers, would you understand with me what this represents? It's not us saying, yes, I want to go to heaven someday. Yes, I want to accept I want to accept the gift. Yes, I want to. Yeah, this is us saying, this is how we have been redeemed. This is why we can go forth and be like Jesus. This is why we can go forth and be like Peter and live out our faith and do this thing. Be sold out, be bought in, whatever you want to call it. So that when people say, look at us, they say, truth be told, something happened. Something's different. This is it. This is it. Let's take the bread, uh, the bread, which represents the body that was broken for you and I, and let's eat. And let's take the cup that represents the blood that was spilled for you and I. Let's drink. Let's pray together. Jesus, as we look to you in a trying time in our history, I think we all have ideas of who we want to be, of who we, we see ourselves as, is who we feel called to be. But the truth is, if we're not living out who you called us to be, then we're not on the right path. I pray for the person in the room who has felt a calling from God to go and do something, to live and act differently, to be someone else. I pray that they would follow through with that and that they wouldn't just continue being so-and-so, the Christian. They would be so-and-so, the foundation of something new. Lord, we're in a time of our, of our history in which there are plenty of doors that can be opened. I pray for our community. I pray for our students. I pray for the adults here, that we would be people that go out, open doors, make changes, do things on your behalf, with you being our faithful leader and our guide. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for your redemption. Thank you for your peace. And thank you for leading us. In Jesus' name, amen.